Coal. Over 400 million tons of bituminous coal is taken out of the ground every year in this country. Coal to make steel, to power generators, coal for a hundred byproducts. In many sections of the United States, coal is king. Yet today, coal is a king on a tottering throne. Channel 3 News presents the first in a series of programs on one of America's basic industries. Tonight, men and the mind. Now, WSAZ News Director, Boz Johnson. Coal is one of the primary natural resources of America. We've fought, we've won two world wars powered by coal. Coke from coal is essential in the production of steel. Coal's used in industrial furnaces throughout the country. It still does a business in home heating. Utilities are big users of the product. And yet it's common knowledge that coal is in the midst of a serious slump. Production is off some 20% in the past three years. Employment has shown a serious decline. To consider coal's problems and potential, we must first know something about the industry, something about the product. Mother Nature, in her own mysterious way, converts dead and decaying vegetable matter into coal. But it takes her roughly a hundred million years. The United States is blessed with tremendous reserves of coal. There are good deposits in Illinois, in Indiana, Pennsylvania, in many places. Draw a circle within a radius of a hundred miles of Huntington and Charleston, West Virginia. In that area, you'll find roughly a third of the nation's bituminous coal production capacity. Southern West Virginia, Eastern Kentucky, Southeastern Ohio, and the Appalachian area of Virginia. This is where coal is king. In these mountains, under these valleys, lie huge reserves of the country's best quality bituminous coal. Some of the coal is buried hundreds of feet below the ground, or far back within the rugged mountains. But there are many places where the seams of coal are clearly visible on the hillsides of the region. This is a seam of coal, and it's a good one. Where the coal is close to the surface, strip mining becomes profitable. Huge shovels scoop out the coal and start it on its way to market. This is one of the easiest and most profitable methods of mining, but it does have its problems. Strip mining scars the landscape. Expensive and time-consuming reforestation and re-landscaping are necessary to restore the terrain. It hasn't always been done in the past, but this is changing. These shovels pick up 35 cubic yards to a bite. Two bites fill a railroad car. These two shovels and a handful of men can dig a million tons of coal a year. This is a rugged land, which would never be worth much for farming. But these shovels find a valuable crop already provided, ready for harvesting. From the shovel to the truck. And then to the railroad. It's a quick trip from the hillside to the bayou. There is another means of mining the surface coal. This consists of boring it out by huge augers. These films were taken at the Clinchfield Coal Company operations at Wyden, West Virginia. The first step again requires the use of a big shovel. Surface earth and rock must be moved away to expose the seam. Then once again, it's up to the auger to get the coal. Many operations, such as this one, have sprung up in West Virginia and Kentucky. You can spot them in two ways. One, by seeing the huge augers themselves standing ready, or by seeing the aftermath, a regular row of huge holes drilled into the mountainside. An underground mine could probably never come this close to the hillside, but with the auger, this scene becomes mineable coal right to the surface. And this is the evidence. Coal was here. Auger mining got it. Strip mining and auger mining have assumed a prominent place in the coal industry. But still, a major share of coal mining is carried on underground. There's a familiar phrase, you could never get me inside a coal mine for any amount of money. But really, what's it, in, what's it like inside a coal mine? In fact, what do we know about coal, coal mining, and the coal miner? We have frequently seen scenes like this throughout the area. We know in a vague way this is a mining area. Most of us have been close enough to recognize a coal tipple and some of the main buildings associated with mining. But for the vast majority of West Virginians, Kentuckians, and Ohioans, 
our knowledge stops there. And where knowledge stops, mystery and misinformation about our basic industry spring up to fill the void. Visions of pick and shovel and back-breaking work all under the constant threat of accident too often form the public image of a coal miner's life. But in our, in our understanding of coal and the coal miner, most of us have never passed this point, the portal, the entry, the beginning point of the mine. To get an understanding of coal mining today, we asked Island Creek Coal Company for permission to take film inside one of their mines. We met their operations vice president, N.T. Comitia, at Amherstdale, West Virginia. It was agreed photographer John Kaloran and I would go into Island Creek's Guyon number one mine. But first, a look at where we were going. Inside the company's building, in their engineering room, we looked at a map of Guyon number one. This complicated map shows the maze of passageways underground. Island Creek safety director, C.E. Linkus, shows the route we'll take underground, back down the main line, way down the main line, down to this point, then off to the left, up to the face of the mine, the face. That's where they're mining the coal. And it's five miles from daylight, five miles back in the mine to section one. With assistant mine superintendent Harry Bushell as a guide, we began our trip in mid-morning. We would not emerge until mid-afternoon. As the electric car speeds back into the mountain, the first impression of the novice is, why did I ever agree to this? But as you see the total unconcern of the men with you, curiosity overcomes fear. Harry, how far back in do we go before we reach the base? Approximately five miles from the drift now. Now, how long is it going to take us to make that trip? Well, it'll take us a little longer than usual because we're not traveling very fast. It takes the man trip approximately 20 minutes to make it. Harry, in some places, this mine roof gets down pretty close to us. How high is it in this spot? Well, I'd say uh, along here it'd be about four feet. Now, when we get back to the base, what will we find back there? How high is it? Well, where we're going, it's about seven feet. This is a large scene, high coal, they call it. But that's not always the case. High quality coal can be profitably mined from seams only 30 inches high, where miners never get off their hands and knees. The historic picture of a coal mine inside is that it's black. But all of this on this part of the main line is white. Why is this so? Well, rock dust, uh, when you spray it on the ribs like this picture, coal incombustible. In other words, uh, it, it cuts down the probability of an explosion. Now, this is done all through the mine, is it? Yes, sir, including all the working places. Now, we're coming to a, a door here right in this main haulage way. Why is the door here? Well, that's to direct the uh, flow of air. It's, it's, it's called a trap door. The door keeps air flowing in the proper direction. But in case of fire, opening it could change the flow, direct smoke and fumes away from men back in the mine. Harry, while we've stopped here, what is this shop here? This is a troubleshooter shanty. They troubleshoot on the sections from here. They have a major replacement parts for all the different equipment on the sections. What's this coming to us, Harry? This is a mainline trip motor coming from section number one. And uh, what's he got behind him? What's he hauling? Triple loads. There it comes, the product of guy number one. There's the coal. Close by, we can see one of the main passageways cutting off from a main line, blocked off by a newly constructed wall. It's part of the mine's air conditioning system. The main haulage way where we are is a major fresh air intake. Parallel passages are used for exhausting stale air. The completed one, and this one the men are now building, keep air flowing in the proper direction, keep fresh and bad air from ever mingling. One of our party brushed an object hanging from the mine roof, recalling vividly the possibility of accident. It's a stretcher and above it, one of the direction markers in case of trouble. We're now close to the working area of the mine, the face. The final hundred yards you make on foot. There were periodic lights down the main line, but at the face, the only light comes from the ever-present miner's headlamps and from lights on equipment. Our photographic lights will actually make the mine appear brighter than it really is. 
first, one of the continuing safety checks. An experienced miner knows a safe roof simply by the sound. And here is the coal, seven feet high and wide as the mountain. Safety director Linkus doesn't like the look of this projection. If it fell and someone were near, it could prove fatal. He'll have it down in a matter of minutes. But on to the face. On with our one day short course in coal mining. The first step here is to make a deep incision across the base of the coal, and then a vertical one in the middle. This helps the coal to fall properly when it's dynamited. To perform the operation, a 16-ton giant, an electric cutting machine. Billy Ray Hoosier operates the cutting machine. In effect, it's a monstrous chainsaw. As do all machines in Gaia number one, this operates off AC current, driving an 11-foot blade back into the coal. Strong as these steel teeth are, the life expectancy of most is less than a day. But before you tamper with Mother Earth, more precautions. The mine roof here is exceptionally good, but this timber helps keep vibration from causing trouble. Now, we're ready to cut. There's no place for sound to escape inside a mine. When machines are working, you know. a mine cutting machine typifies the new coal miner. He's not just another working man, he's a specialist. With that 11 foot blade out in front of him, he must have a feel for the equipment. Too much pressure or too little, and a $60,000 machine can be badly damaged. Billy knows by the feel when the blade's cutting coal and when it's too close to the rock beneath. It's precision work, but it must be accomplished quickly. He'll cut the full 20 foot width of the passage, then make a four foot vertical cut and be out of here in 15 minutes. There are six parallel tunnels being cut through the coal. As soon as he finishes one, he moves on to the next. And right behind him, the next phase of the operation. And this is the pattern. As one machine completes its job, another moves in. Speed, efficiency. These are essential to turn out enough coal at a competitive price. The job here is to drill holes back into the coal where charges of dynamite will be placed. Another expensive machine, another skilled operator. By now, it's become apparent that mining today bears little resemblance to Tennessee Ernie Ford's 16 ton. There are nine men in this section. Working together, they'll turn out some 1,400 tons of coal on a good day, over 100 tons per man. Remember that this coal has formed undisturbed for 100 million years. At this spot in the slate above, the fossil remains of a once mighty tree which died and fell in prehistoric times. Following the drill, checking for any trace of gas, comes one of the real veterans of this mine. The Deacon, they call him. His name, Ernest Legrand. Deacon has been working in this same mine for 36 years. We'll talk with him later. Deacon is the shot fireman. He works 700 feet under the ground, five miles back in the mine, and always with a case of dynamite by his side. Into the holes, and there are half a dozen of them, he places a charge of dynamite and then tamps it in with clay dummies. The blast should loosen the coal, drop much of it, and prepare it for loading. The use of dynamite tags this as a conventional mine. In other mines, the use of a continuous miner eliminates the need for blasting. The continuous miner is a mechanical marvel which, held against the face, performs all the operations of coal mining. But in Gaia number one, Island Creek believes the conventional method is best. To each charge of dynamite, Deacon attaches a blasting cap. The wires are then hooked together, and the detonating wire is run back away from the face and around the corner. Mine law requires everyone to be around the corner. No one is to be in direct line with the blast, even though most coal will be thrown only 10 feet or so. This is the coal as Mother Nature formed it. Man will now blast it down. And then the cry, fire, fire in the fire. The sound is surprisingly not loud, but you feel the concussion and the rush of air hundreds of yards away. It's a disconcerting sensation. And it happens like clockwork every quarter of an hour in guy in number one. After the blast, another safety check. Check for gas, check the condition of the roof. Gas and roof fall, two of the biggest hazards underground. Every 70 feet, the men cut across to join the six parallel tunnels.
As they proceed, the mine is literally honeycombed with crisscross passageways. They're cutting across now. And as the coal loader gets into position, we'll go next door for a better view of it. The loader was one of the first items of mechanization in the mines that came over 20 years ago. And this is very similar to the first one. It looks for all the world like a dime novel creature from outer space. These steel gathering arms move the coal onto a conveyor chain that runs the length of the monster. It eats its way through coal with an insatiable appetite. More than 50 tons fell with a dynamite charge. The loader will pick four times that much in an hour. Everyone here is mechanized except the shot fireman. In fact, he's the only one in the section who doesn't have a machine to ride. There's a joke around the mine now that the shot firemen feel this is discrimination and they're agitating for something to ride. This is not necessarily a typical coal mine. Guy in number one is one of Island Creek's best producers. It has a high seam, good roof, and the most modern equipment. Many mines operate in seams a third this height. Many, if not most mines in the region, require extensive timbering to shore up the layer of rock above. Almost all are mechanized, though perhaps not to this extent. But Gaia number one does provide a dramatic illustration of how far coal mining has come from its pick and shovel beginning. But back to the loader. Once gathered, the coal is deposited in a shuttle car pulled up right behind it. One loader keeps two shuttle cars constantly at work, hauling the coal away. We'll pick up that shuttle car at its destination in just a moment. But let's stay at the face. We've said this is good roof. It doesn't require timbering. Instead, roof bolts help the roof support the thousands of tons of weight bearing down from above. State and federal mine inspectors determine how much roof bolting is needed to prevent a fall, and they set up a pattern. Then the section foreman marks with white paint where the bolts are needed. The hole is drilled straight up through the rock overhead. Into that hole goes an expansion bolt 36 inches long. It's tightened into place there to remain. A small, thin rod with thousands upon thousands of tons of rock and earth bearing down. And it does the job. One more area in which the machine has improved man's efficiency and safety underground. Combine all the operations we've seen at the face of this mine, and it would take nine men 11 days to turn out the same amount of coal that these nine with their specialized equipment have produced in one ship. But now let's catch up with the load of coal on that shuttle car we saw a few moments ago. This rubber-tired vehicle has traveled 100 yards or more to bring the coal out to the mine's rail cars. The load is dumped onto a conveyor called the elevator. It rides up the elevator, through a brattice cloth curtain hung there to direct airflow. As fast as this car is emptied and out of the way, another will drive up to take its place. The coal goes up the elevator, under the curtain, and into waiting mine cars on the other side. This is the final step inside the mine. When a string of these cars are loaded, they'll be hauled out of the mine and to the tip. At this point, one man controls both the elevator and the movement of the cars beneath. As one car is filled, he moves it ahead. Another comes beneath the elevator, ready to receive its share. This is the end of the cycle. From the time the cutting machine first attacked this pole till now, it has taken less than an hour and a quarter. Every mark on this scoreboard indicates one more mine car loaded. They'll load almost 240 cars in this ship. Five tons per car, that's 1,200 tons. And that's a lot of coal. Our crew watched the proceedings seated casually atop the huge electrical transformer, turning out 440 volts AC. But now, the mine train is ready. Slowly at first, then picking up speed as it goes, the train and its cars move toward the mouth of the mine. The coal will be washed, sized, mixed to specifications, and shipped hundreds of miles, perhaps a thousand, to the buyer. Now we're on our way out. Our electric car, Mitchell's Bird, awaits. It's named for Chief Mine Electrician Jennings Mitchell, who built it himself. We took our time coming in, 
but we'll make tracks on the return trip. 25 miles an hour, straight up the main line toward daylight, five miles away. We've been comfortably cool inside the mine, but now, traveling against the rush of incoming air, it becomes chilly and then downright cold. The reflection off the car ahead indicates the strength of the headlamps on our vehicle. In fact, some of our film in the main haulage way was taken with just that light. Two thousand men must have traveled this main line in the last 40 years, but never have any gone into the mines with the equipment and safety of today's miner. Still, even the most calloused miner must feel some subconscious sigh of relief when off in the distance he can once again see sunlight. The last of the novice returned from underground is one of surprise. In high call with a seven foot high seam, you don't have the confined sensation one might expect. You lose track of distance and depth and it's just like being in the basement. We've all heard about mechanization in the coal mines. Now you've seen it. But what are the men? How do they react? What do they think of their work? We waited in the mine office for the first shift of section one to come out of the mine. Ernest Legrand, Deacon remember they call him, was the shot fireman. He spends his working life inside Gaia number one with a case of dynamite by his side. And it doesn't worry him a bit. The title deacon, incidentally, is correct. He's an ordained deacon in the Missionary Baptist Church. He works in the mine during the week, preaches on Sunday. Deacon has over 36 years experience in Gaia number one. In 1924, there were no machines in the mine. He used a hand auger to dig out the coal. The miner held the auger braced against his body and pressed it against the coal with all of his might. Then, as he turned a crank, it bored out the coal a little at a time. Instead of dynamite, black powder was used. If the ventilation was not the best, black powder could leave smoke at the working face for as long as a day. Many became sick from the fumes. Many nearly died. With all of this, Deacon told us that a miner's average production then was 10 to 12 tons a day. Today, it's 10 times that much. A question for Deacon, is safety in the mine today much improved? Do you consider it really much safer today than it was when you first started working? Yeah, the mine is much safer today than it was uh, 36 years ago. What's, what's happened to make it safe? Well, I believe uh, when I first went in the mine, men didn't, did not go to school to learn about mine. But now, most anyone goes in the mine now has some knowledge of mine if I'm studying. Naturally, when they go in, they more about to take care of Deacon is a veteran. He's seen the good days and he's seen the bad. We asked if he had it all to do over again, would he work in the mines? If you all over again, if chances are I may do something different than I have in the past because I know more about it. <laughs> but you still work in the mines? I was still working in the mines because I think it's just about as safe and industrial man can work. <laughs> You're not worried then? I'm not worried. Just and you think that uh, even to do it over, you'd have been a miner? If I had to do it over again, I would still be a miner. And you'll find the same answer throughout the coal fields of the region. And when a mine closes down, it's easy to see the problem. A miner wants to be a miner. He likes his work. And what's more, he likes his pay. Many of the men at Guyon Number 1 earn in excess of seven and $8,000 a year. The union wage is $28 a day. The men at this mine are now working four days a week. Many weeks, it's five. But this is not typical of the coal industry today. Many mines are closed completely. Others operating three-day weeks. But the miners an optimistic soul, always looking for the upturn. Industry leaders are sure the upturn is coming. And when it does, the men who do work will earn a good living. But the man in the coal fields is bound to mining by much more than a paycheck. It's a tradition. We spoke with Luther Preston, mine foreman at Guyon number one. Now the general public feeling is that uh, you couldn't catch me inside a coal mine. These men don't feel that way at all. What is it? Is it that they've been raised around the mines and know what to expect? Well, 
They're just like myself, most of them. They started as a boy, and their fathers was coal miners, and uh, uh, they've just been raised. And it's just, just in their blood. That's the general run of it. Luther himself has been in the mine since 1936. But just to be sure, we talked with one of the younger men. Billy Ray Hoosier works the cutting machines on the day shift in Section 1. Still a young man, Billy has nonetheless been in the mines for 12 years. He has three uncles working for the same company at the same place. As you can see, Billy's quite an artist with that cutting machine, one of the best in the mine. You're uh, obviously good with machinery. You get a feel for machines. Um, means that you probably, when you, when you first went to work, have had your choice of any one of a number of different types of jobs and different work. What made you decide to go into coal mine? <laughs> I couldn't say. Did, did you make a conscious decision, or did you just... That's about all you've got at this place. Oh, <laughs> uh, you plan on staying in coal mining? Yes, I'll stay here. Uh, have, have you got many mines closed down, men out of work in the area? There's quite a few have. What, uh, what's the feeling of, of the men in the area when a mine is closed down and they don't know exactly when it's going to reopen? Uh, do they go out and look for something else, or do they wait for the mine? Well, I think most of them wish for a check, and then out there they go look. <laughs> do you have many people who, uh, in a time when some mines are closed, who leave the area, or do they, or do they stay right here? Yes. Well, yeah, maybe. Because they will be coming back after they lost it cut off. Is this generally the feeling of, of the men who've uh, been cut off from, the, um, from mines as, as the uh, employment falls? Do they recognize that they're they not coming back? They don't think they'll be back. And now they don't come back. There's room, of course, for some disagreement with his figures, but whether you agree with them or not, the fact remains that many of today's unemployed coal miners will never work in a mine today. And what happens to them and their families and their future is one of the most pressing problems of government. But tonight, we've seen the bright side. Men at work in a modern mine producing coal at a rate their fathers never thought possible. The men earn good money, work in the safest mine conditions in history. What then is the problem? Why is the industry working at only half to two-thirds of capacity? Will the coal market keep dwindling, employing fewer and fewer men? Former West Virginia Governor Cecil Underwood, in his final State of the State message, told the legislature that coal is still king and must be the keystone of mountain state economy for a long time to come. The same is true throughout the region. But if coal is king, it is certainly a king on a tottering throne. And the question, is the throne likely to topple? We'll consider the problem in our next program in this series. We call it the economic squeeze. I hope you'll join us. Thanks and good night.